I was kind of miserable. I was working these cleaning jobs that were not fulfilling to me. I was looking at these other people who had these lives that I wanted to have. And I think because I was in that mindset, the worst thing happened. Welcome to Career Relaunch, the podcast focused on helping you pursue more meaningful work. My name is Joseph Liu, and I'm here to help you gain the clarity, confidence, and courage to overcome the challenges of making changes to your career so you can do more fulfilling work and enjoy your professional life. In each episode, I feature people who have stepped off the beaten path to reinvent their careers and do work that matters. We talk through their unique personal stories, the challenges they overcame, and the lessons they learned along the way to help you take your own brave steps to relaunch your own career. Today, my guest is going to discuss how she relaunched her career from being a house cleaner to a professional photographer. We'll discuss how to deal with hitting rock bottom and how your mindset can have a direct impact on the trajectory of your career. Afterwards, during today's Mental Fuel, I'm going to explain how I think about my own self-worth. Before we start today's conversation, I wanted to let you know that I'm going to be giving a talk on how to reinvent your career at the Birmingham Design Festival's upcoming Glug event focused on the theme of rebirth. Now, if you're not familiar with Glug events, they're sort of like TED Talks for creative communities around the world. And this particular Glug event I'm speaking at will be on the evening of Thursday, April the 4th in Birmingham in the UK. The other speakers will be Claire Farrell, the founder of the independent art organization Work, spelled W-E-R-K. James Greenfield, the creative director and founder of the Koto Brand Studio, and the illustrator and graffiti artist Anatomics. So if you're interested in hearing how to take your idea, brand, or career in a new direction, you can get tickets to the Glug event at careerrelaunch.net slash glug19. That's careerrelaunch.net slash glug19. Okay, on to our interview. Today, I'm speaking with Jamie Love, who's a creative, visionary, and homeschooling mother who owns and operates Jamie Love Photography, a portrait studio based in Ithaca, New York. She completed her BFA in photography and digital imaging from the Ringling College of Art and Design in 2003. Afterwards, she became a single mother to three children and dug herself out of the trenches of self-loathing and abusive relationships. She tapped into her own difficult journey toward self-love to create a career focused on empowering and inspiring her clients through dream portrait experiences that celebrate their strengths. Now, one reason why I found Jamie's perspectives so valuable is because she shares a very honest story about what it's like to feel completely stuck in a really low point in your career, something I've certainly felt myself, and something you may have struggled with or are even currently struggling with right now. And I think she gives us a good reminder that getting yourself out of a bad situation starts from within. You can get all the show notes from today's episode at careerrelaunch.net slash 55. Jamie spoke with me from Ithaca, New York. Okay, good morning, Jamie, and welcome to Career Relaunch. Good morning. Great to have you on the show, and I'm really looking forward to talking with you about some of the major chapters in your career, including your time as a house cleaner and now as a photographer. And I also want to talk about some aspects of your personal journey, including managing your career as a single parent and also how a specific injury became a turning point in your career. But I was hoping we could start by having you first explain what you do as a photographer and also what you're focused on in your personal life. So as a photographer, I have a boutique photography studio. I do maternity portraits. I do newborn portraits, senior portraits. I also do business headshots as well as um, work style sessions and personal branding. Do you have a favorite type of photography that you like to do these days? I like doing them all and all for various reasons. I've been primarily doing a lot of senior portraits recently. That's been my main thing. And so I really, really enjoy that, getting to work with teens. Okay. Well, we're going to definitely come back to that topic at the end because I know that you're working on an interesting project related to seniors in high school. So we'll definitely come back to that. What about in, in the rest of your life outside of your career? What's, what's keeping you busy right now? Well, I homeschool my children. And so that keeps me busy when I'm not doing photography work. And as well, just doing a lot of introspective meditation, mindset work, things like that. Spending a lot of time out in nature as well, trying to be more outside and less in front of the computer. (laughs) 
What a great idea. Yeah, right? I, I think that's fantastic. <laughs> well, you have not always been a full-time photographer, and I know you keep yourself busy with many things right now, but I was wondering if you could take us back in time, Jamie, and explain what one of your former careers was. And I think when we spoke before, you mentioned that you spent some time as a house cleaner. So I was hoping you could tell us how you ended up being a house cleaner, and then we can move forward from there. Goodness. It started after a separation with my son's father, and I was left to single parent. I needed something that I made the most amount of money in the shortest amount of time, <laughs> given that time is is not always easy for me to come by as a single parent. And so somebody mentioned to me, oh, well, you know, you could do some house cleaning and and make a fair amount of money doing that. And and I enjoyed cleaning. So I thought, okay, well, let's just try this. And I had helped people organize their homes and, and do projects like that. And so it wasn't new to me to do house cleaning. And so you know, I took on a few clients and then those clients referred me and then it turned out into this major thing where I was doing anywhere between eight to 15 clients a week. And can you just share a couple example profiles of the people or families who were your cleaning clients? They varied. Um, some of them were elderly people who just needed some assistance and couldn't really do it themselves. And then I worked for a lot of people who had various allergies, and they would have me come in because I had special HEPA filter vacuum that I had to purchase, and I used all eco-friendly products. And so my main clientele were people who either had environmental concerns or you know, needed assistance. Can you just give a glimpse into what it's like to go into the homes of people, to clean their places for them, and also... I guess knowing that this was something that you were doing kind of out of sheer necessity. Yeah, definitely out of necessity. <laughs> I mean, though I found ways to, you know, mentally appreciate and enjoy as much as I possibly could in the moment, it was definitely a necessity thing. And it's interesting going into somebody's home and having to clean up for them. There's a difference, you know, there's there's house cleaning where you go in and you you actually are cleaning and then there's like Maid work where people just want you to clean up after them or their children. And thankfully, I didn't have too, too much of that. It was mostly just I would come in and do a, a weekly deep clean for somebody. Sometimes it was like a focused project, and other times it was a general clean about. <laughs> it's a very personal experience, people having you come into their homes and you learn a lot about them through cleaning their homes. Their particularities, really. <laughs> what's important to them and you know what they prefer. And during that time when you were cleaning people's homes, Jamie, what was running through your head? And I guess I'm assuming you had a lot of time to think about a lot of different things. And I'm wondering specifically about whether you thought at all about your own career during this time. Absolutely. Sometimes the clients were there and sometimes they weren't. I found it more difficult when they were there. In particular, I had this one client who is a published author. And so I would go over and she would just be sitting on her laptop writing. And, you know, I also love to write. <laughs> so sometimes I would go over and I'd be like, goodness, you know, imagine if I would be spending my time writing, I maybe I'd be a published author by now and I wouldn't be cleaning. <laughs> so there was definitely, you know, introspective moments when I would be in, in people's homes and, and wonder, well, what are they doing for a living that's affording them the ability to have me come in and just and just clean for them? And how can I be in that position? <laughs> I mean, at the same time, I could maintain a, a Zen ho hum thing. Sometimes I would just put in my my earbuds and listen to a podcast, all the while trying to figure out how to get out of that situation. <laughs> Speaking of which, I know you had something happen to you with a physical injury that almost forced your hand here. What what exactly happened to you? Yeah, so I had finished, you know, a really long week. It was my 15 client week. <laughs> I went home to do some stretching and some yoga afterwards and my left leg went numb on me and I was kind of like what's going on? I was trying to stretch it out and it wasn't helping. And then I started having muscle, muscle spasms. I ended up in the emergency room that evening. And they told me that I had herniated a disc in my 
lower back. Then I was no longer able to clean. <laughs> I was no longer to do, able to do anything at that point. I was in the hospital room for a good week as they did all these tests to figure out what else might be going on and why I couldn't use my leg. My leg had been, it was completely numb from the toe all the way up to the hip. Wow. Okay. And so then how did you get yourself to move forward in spite of the, the physical injury that you had? I had to take time off. <laughs> I was forced to take time off. And, you know, when you're, when you're sitting on a bed and you have nothing else to do but think about how to get better and how to heal your body, you, you know, you go inward. And part of that for me was trying to figure out what I was going to do next for a job, considering my physical limitations that, you know, even after a disc herniation, even if you heal it, you still have to be easy on your back. You know, you can't do a lot of heavy lifting. You certainly can't be climbing stairs, carrying heavy vacuums. <laughs> you know, I had to reconsider, well, what can I do for employment that's going to make sense with this new body that I'm now living in? So then my mother was like, you know, why, ne why didn't you ever do anything with your photography career? So, you know, I had gone to college for photography probably. 10 years prior to all of this. And I hadn't been in a position to ever purchase the equipment needed to start my photography career to do what I knew how to do, what I was trained to do. And so I, I said, well, good point. Maybe I should get back into that. Maybe I should look into getting some funding or figure out how to get the upfront costs. And so that became my focus <laughs> was, was getting the funds to start a career with the time off that I had um, while I was healing my body. You alluded to this earlier, and I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about the effect it had on you of going from having a partner to being on your own as you were thinking about your career, especially with children. Single parenting is definitely a, a whole new host of challenges where I had a partner that I could say, okay, well, I'm going to go work and you watch the kids. It didn't become that simple anymore. <laughs> or where I had a partner where it was like, okay, well, I'm going to work and our combined income can pay for childcare. Um, I didn't have that anymore. And so I had to work through a lot of the challenges of trying to figure out a way to have someone watch the kids, despite the fact that I didn't have income to pay, pay for childcare. It's, it's kind of like a double-edged sword. You know, you need, you need work. <laughs> to have money, but then in order, and me, I had three kids at that time. And so to pay for childcare for three kids is, is rather expensive. Is there something that you think people misunderstand about what it's like to be a single parent, especially when it comes to your career? People are always full of assumptions as to why you're a single parent. First of all, they either think something's flawed with you or, you know, why is she a single parent or how did she get in that position in the first place? It's hard to have a career as a single parent in the sense that your time is already stretched thin um, because you're the primary breadwinner, you're the primary everything. And so, you know, having to have a career amidst that is, is difficult. <laughs> it requires a, a lot of uh, time management, juggling and scheduling and priority scheduling. And there's definitely, you know, a lot of assumptions that go in people's minds around what that all entails or, you know, looking at big jobs, like, like as I'm doing now, people know that I'm a single parent and, and they'll almost say things like, well, are you sure you can take that on? Or are you sure you have time for that? There's this assumption that, you know, you can't figure it out because you're alone. <laughs> so clearly you have figured it out. And yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious how you made that transition with all the challenges that come from being a single parent, I think I spoke with you before I mentioned that we've got a 15 month old at, at home and even with two people, like I, it's tough. It's, it's yeah. like all hands on deck <laughs> all the time. And so, so I'd be really interested to hear how you pulled this off and was able to break into the industry of being a photographer full, full time. And I think it started with a, a program through a local bank. Is that right? Yeah, my local credit union 
they have a program. It's called the IDA program where we live. And it's partially grant funded for people with low income, which is the position I was in at the time, where you save $1,000 and then you take some business classes and then they match you with $2,000. And so there you have $3,000 and the education to start a business of your own. And when I found out about this program, I was like, oh my God, this is exactly what I need (laughs) to get myself rolling. And so I took the program and it took me a good year and some change to save up that $1,000 and take the money classes that I needed to get in that position where I then had the $3,000 and I used that to buy my studio light kit. Right. Yeah. Cause you, you didn't have any of your equipment yet, I guess. No. Uh, Well, see now when I had started out in photography about, well, in college back in 2003, all of my gear has since been completely outdated at this point. (laughs) Right. So I had to, I had to reinvest and, um, I had an outdated camera, but I was like, well, I can start with this and just get some stuff under my belt enough to save up money to get the camera. And so it started with the lights. It was like, okay, I have the lights in place. And, you know, then I got the camera based off of a few jobs that I had gotten, you know, and then over time just kept saving and saving and to get all the equipment I needed, um, which was a huge investment up front. Starting a photography business is it's a big investment, at least to have, you know, the proper lighting and all the gear that I was accustomed to working with on a professional level. I didn't want to take any any shortcuts in terms of quality of equipment. So <laughs> I just went for it. Now I know a lot of people who love doing photography as a hobby and they think it'd be so cool to become a photographer. And yet I know very few people, at least personally, who have been able to become full-time photographers, what do you think is the hardest part of making it as a full-time photographer? Well, it's definitely tricky to stand out in an industry where there is a ton of hobbyist people that can seemingly do a similar job. For me, the biggest challenge was understanding my worth, um, which was rooted in a whole lot of other things about self-worth, you know, through everything I'd been through. And, um, understanding that my value was really high, that I wasn't just a hobbyist, that I am a skilled professional, that I was trained to do this and to put myself out there in a way that is slightly uncomfortable. (laughs) I was never a very outgoing person in, you know, I'm, I'm more of an introvert, if you will. What was the most uncomfortable part of putting yourself out there? Marketing myself in the community and I guess that's the thing, because when I'm one-on-one and I'm in a session, I'm fine. Like I'm, re- I have a really good one-on-one rapport with my clients, even a team. You know, I go in and I do a corporate team, and I feel like I've got that. I feel confident in what I'm doing. But the initial, you know, putting myself out there, like, okay, hi, I'm someone that you could hire, is is a little awkward at first. I mean, I'm used to it now, <laughs> but that that was the hardest part initially. You know, in marketing, they say, oh you know, do some Facebook live posts and things like that. And I'm always like, oh gosh, (laughs) like this is so strange. (laughs) Yeah. Easier said than done. Yeah. How did you get started? Who was your first client? And and then what what happened after that? Well, interestingly enough, my first client was actually the credit union. (laughs) Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Once they realized what I was capable of, they were like, oh my goodness, well, let's hire you to do all of our marketing. (laughs) So that was a huge boost. You know, I went from having basically zero income to all of a sudden getting a a large corporate job. They hired me off the bat because I had taken the business classes with them and they had a good rapport with me and they, you know, they saw my skill set and what I was capable of and just trusted that I was going to come through. And I did, you know, and I've, I've been working them for two years now. And then from there, it extended into other types of work for for other corporate clients? I put together a website with all the various offerings that I'm capable of doing. And for me, you know, my first year was sort of exploratory. It was like, well, let's see what I get the most of. It was like a market research year almost. Like I was throwing myself out there like, okay, these are all the things I can do. And let's see what, what comes back the most. And for me, that's been seniors and headshots and, and corporate jobs. 
Yeah, that's an interesting approach to it. I, I know that um, for people who have listened to this podcast a lot, they probably know that I'm, I'm quite the planner, especially when it comes to career stuff. And yet it sounds like the way you did it was you kind of put yourself out there in a variety of ways and saw what stuck and rolled with that. And that seems like that's worked pretty well for you. I went in with a strong business plan, which my business plan was see what comes the most. And I priced everything accordingly and I had all my numbers and everything was, was really organized in that way. But yeah, I guess, you know, I was new to the area in a way that I, I had never done a photography business in my town. And so I wasn't sure what would be the most effective business here. Well, the other thing I was hoping to talk with you about, Jamie, was just some of the lessons that you've learned along the way of your own career journey. And one of the things you mentioned to me before this recording was how throwing out your back actually taught you a lot about fear and how fear can lead to this vicious downward cycle of self-limitation. And I was hoping you could tell me a little bit more about how you came to that realization about fear and self-limitation. Well, I think being thrown into the, uh, absolute abyss of hell and pain, (laughs) (laughs) you know, to be frank, was like a crash course. And here's your fear. Here's your worst fear. You know, Uh your worst fear is that you cannot provide for your children and that you're not physically capable of providing for your children. That was rather intense being put in that position. It was so humbling for me. You know, I have a really forthright way of, of getting what I feel like I need in any moment. And the fear stuff for me was, was like having to face it head on and realize that here I was in my, my worst fear that I could possibly imagine. And yet somewhere in there, I was able to find, you know, a place of peace, a place of grace and a place of humility and work through it and realize that, you know, I I kind of had manifested my worst fears almost. I feel like my back going out was was my body's way of saying, here, you want to, you want to say all these fears? Well, here they are. <laughs> oh, <laughs> this is the worst case scenario and let's deal with it. You mean like a self-fulfilling prophecy yeah. of sorts or okay. Oh, almost. I mean, I don't think that I intentionally did that. I wasn't like, here, let me <laughs> fulfill my worst <laughs> right. prophecy. That's kind of what happened is I, I think what it taught me is Prior to my back going out, I was I was kind of miserable. You know, I was, I was working these cleaning jobs that were not fulfilling to me. I was looking at these other people who had these lives that I wanted to have, and I wasn't having them. And it's hard when you're in that position to not get sucked down into this place of depression or this victim mentality or this poor me or, you know, how did I get here? And I think because I was in that mindset of this is terrible. And where, what am I going to do with my life? And the worst thing happened. But then the blessing in that, it helped me to remember that I had a bigger purpose. You know, even though I knew that I had the bigger purpose all along, my bigger purpose was masked by my mindset of I'm frustrated. I'm broke. I don't have what I need. I'm, I'm not all of these terrible things. <laughs> yeah. I guess what you're referring to is this concept of kind of hitting rock bottom. And yeah. I think a lot of people who listen to this show, Jamie, have experienced a moment when they've hit rock bottom in their careers as you did when you hurt your back. And I'm wondering if there's anything you wished you had known that you now know about how to deal with those extremely low points in your career. I think if I had to go back, knowing what I know now about mindset work, I feel like I could have talked myself out of going down that low (laughs) somehow. Maybe maybe I wouldn't have known better, but um, it was part of my lesson personally. There's ways that we can really talk ourselves down into a hole. And what I know now is that anytime you feel that those feelings coming up of you know, I can't do this. I'm never going to make this. Nobody's ever going to hire me. I'm never going to have my dream career. You're kind of creating that for yourself. And I think had I known differently, I would have focused more of my intention on focusing on my strengths. And I can do this and I am capable. And maybe the money isn't here now, but that doesn't mean it won't come another day. 
Yeah, I've also found that to be the case in my own self-employment journey, Jamie, this whole mindset and belief aspect to your work. And I used to kind of shrug it off as being the more like touchy feely side of things and that it wasn't really worth much, but I've actually come to realize that belief really matters a lot and that that belief drives your actions and then those actions end up driving your results and it makes a huge difference. It really does. Absolutely. I, you know, I feel like having confidence is, is something that I didn't necessarily have. And I had to find that in myself because, you know, there's, there's always this place in us that sometimes it takes seeing somebody else do something and, and we're like, well, I can do better than that. You know, <laughs> it's, sometimes it takes seeing other situations and to help you realize like, wow, I, I actually am capable or you know, I am better than I thought I was. And, you know, over time it builds up and you do, you develop a belief in yourself and then there you are. Even, even in times when I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, this is the biggest job I've ever gotten. And will I be able to pull this off? I had my moments of like, oh my God, here I am. I'm given this opportunity. Don't screw it up. <laughs> right. But the thing is, is that when I get in that moment, When I'm in my zone, which for me, taking portraits and doing photography work, it's something that's innate in me. And so I guess what I learned is that I just need to do it and I need to stop questioning myself. The self-doubt will will ruin everything. For me, when I'm in my zone, everything just comes and it's fine. And so it's like working through the, the mental blocks that prevent us from succeeding, I guess. Well, before we wrap up with one of the projects you're working on right now, Jamie, I had one more question about some of the things you've learned along the way. And we've talked about the challenges of being a single parent while trying to also manage your career. What's something that you've learned about yourself through the process of balancing the two? I've learned a lot about what's most important to me, I think. Having to prioritize your work and your career. And for me, homeschooling on, on top of that. And then, and then there's just family time, which is, you know, it's like, okay, I work. And then, you know, well, where's the time for us to actually just enjoy ourselves and go out for a walk as a family? Cause we are just juggling all of these things. And, you know, I've had to do a lot of introspective work on finding out what's a priority and, and like being more heart centered and, trying to be more present in the moment, if you will, and say, well, is this really the, what's the most important right now? And so I, I guess that's what I've learned the most about myself through this process is having to be more heart-centered and intentional with what I prioritize. I would love to wrap up, Jamie, by talking about one of your projects that I know is really important to you, and that's the Senior Empowerment Collective Project which I understand is focused on teenage self-esteem. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So I started a program for high school seniors um, called the Senior Empowerment Collective. You know, I work with a lot of seniors and teenagers are not the most secure people. They they have self-esteem concerns there, you know, and especially with all the social media stuff that I certainly didn't have to deal with as a teenager. There's a lot of comparison uh, between themselves and, I wanted to develop a program where everybody was on an equal playing field and everybody could focus on their strengths and, you know, help them to feel more empowered and confident in themselves through their portrait experience. And so, you know, I do their senior portrait with them, but we also do group shoots together as a team. Uh, We do community volunteering. I do volunteer hours with the teens. And I also give them weekly mindset mantras to focus on. (laughs) Oh, cool. Um, Things that were helpful for me and in learning my own self confidence. And so, you know, it's my way of trying to, you know, maybe derail some of the the negative impacts of low self esteem in the community. Um, And I think it's a great place to start with teenagers who are sort of on this precipice of adulthood and going out into the world. And I think, you know, going out into the world with confidence and knowing who you are and feeling confident in your strengths is, is a gift. So it's something that I like to do with them. That is fantastic. Well, that sounds like a really cool program. And 
if people want to learn more about you or the Senior Empowerment Collective or just the photography work that you do, where can they go? So they can go to my website. Um, it's www.jamielove.photography. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Jamie, for telling us more about how you shifted from being a cleaner to a photographer, the challenges of single parenthood, especially as it relates to your career, and also the importance of self-belief. So best of luck with your photography business and your senior empowerment collective. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I hope you enjoyed hearing Jamie's thoughts on bouncing back from hitting rock bottom, figuring out your own self-worth, and making sure you maintain the right mindset. Now it's time to wrap up with today's Mental Fuel, where I'm going to talk about how I've thought about my own self-worth, especially as it relates to pricing my services as a self-employed consultant. Before we get to today's Mental Fuel, I'd like to thank Audible for supporting this episode of Career Relaunch. Audible is the premier provider of digital audiobooks offering over 180,000 audiobook titles for listening anytime and anywhere on your favorite device. And for listeners of this show, they're offering a free audiobook download and 30-day trial. Just go to audibletrial.com slash career relaunch to download your free audiobook today. This is the part of the show called Mental Fuel, where I finish the show with a brief personal story related to one of the topics we covered today and wrap up with a simple challenge to help you move forward with your own career goals. And for today's Mental Fuel, I'd like to pick up on one of the topics Jamie touched on about understanding your own self-worth, figuring out the value you can offer, and dealing with the initial awkwardness of putting yourself out there and charging for a particular service you're offering, in her case, photography. In my case, figuring out what I'm worth is something I've actually wrestled with over the years, especially when I first started my own career consultancy. One of the first things you have to do when you start your own business is to decide how much you want to charge for the service or product you're offering. Although right now I limit myself to one-on-one coaching for only a select number of private clients, when I started off a few years ago, my primary service was career coaching, and one of the biggest questions I had was exactly how much I should charge for the coaching I was offering. It turns out this is a big struggle for a lot of coaches and independent business owners, and although they did touch on this briefly during my coach training, no one really gave any clear guidance on this. Now, pricing wasn't completely a foreign concept to me. I'd spent the prior decade as a marketer, so developing a pricing strategy for products was something that came up on literally every brand I worked on. But there's something a little more uncomfortable and personal about putting a price tag on yourself. The toughest part for me was figuring out what to charge my very first client. I had no proof of concept, I had no client testimonials, and I had actually no clue what my time was really worth. On top of that, I was definitely suffering from a ton of imposter syndrome. I basically felt like a bit of a fraud calling myself a career consultant or career coach or whatever. And honestly, I felt a bit awkward suddenly asking someone to pay me for something I'd already been doing for other people in my professional circles, which was basically being a resource to people at turning points in their careers. So the way I tried to figure this out was to just do a little research and ask around, and I got a very wide range of advice on pricing. One suggestion was to do a top-down calculation, figuring out my target annual income, then backing into an hourly rate based on my expected number of clients and hours of coaching, which actually made a lot of sense to me. Another approach was to price according to the market, to just find out what other coaches were charging. The only problem here was that the spread was enormous. And finally, another approach a very reputable coach in the UK recommended was what she called resonant pricing, which was just saying different fees to yourself and seeing which one felt right, which at first I thought was a bit too fluffy for my taste. In the end, I actually ended up doing a combination of all three, And once I landed on a fee I felt was fair to both me and my clients, I immediately raised that figure by 10%, which was some advice I heard from the speaker and author Josh Shipp, because it forced my clients to expect more from me, and for me to really bring my best to all my work, which created a very virtuous cycle with my clients. But it took me a while to get there, and to this day, pricing is one of those things I wrestle with the most on my business because I don't want to overcharge, but I also don't want to sell myself short. Anyway, 
The reason why I'm getting into the details of all this is because pricing is one of those things that ends up being directly related to your self-worth. And what I've found is that when you're starting your own business or side gig or service, you can do all the research you want, but in the end, what you end up charging is very much grounded in what you feel you're worth to others. And I guess one of the things I've had to remind myself and something I try to remind my clients who are trying to open a new chapter in their careers is that you do have something to offer, that you've come this far in life by providing value to others and that this new situation you're in is no different. And similar to what Jamie mentioned during our conversation, if you don't believe in your business or what you can offer, you can bet your prospective clients won't either. I really believe that the majority of your success is driven from within, because without this belief, all the astute business tactics in the world will only carry you so far. This brings me to a quote from David Schwartz, author of The Magic of Thinking Big. Believe it can be done. When you believe something can be done, really believe, your mind will find the ways to do it. Believing a solution paves the way to solution. So my challenge to you is to put yourself out there and start charging what you feel you're worth, even if you don't feel 100% ready yet. I'm talking about putting a price on something valuable you've been doing for free. And once you've done that, to not apologize for what you're offering, to not feel like someone's doing you a favor by paying you for this. Instead, help that person feel good about what they're buying by proudly and unapologetically describing the value you know you're providing. If you're enjoying Career Relaunch and interested in sharing your thoughts with me about the show or your own career challenge, I'd love for you to leave me a voicemail at careerrelaunch.net slash 55, where you can also find a summary of all the key concepts from today's conversation with Jamie. Again, that's careerrelaunch.net slash 55. In our next episode of Career Relaunch, I'll be featuring a lettering artist and designer who transplanted himself from Barcelona to New York City to recreate his career and life there. He's going to talk about what it takes to make it after a big relocation. Thanks so much for listening to Career Relaunch and a special thanks again to Jamie Love for joining us today from Ithaca, New York. This episode was mixed by Richard Pennington, Electrocardiogram wrote and performed our original theme song. I'm Joseph Liu and I'll see you next time.